Bruce, welcome to the show. Justin, I'm glad to be here. It's been a while. We've been trying to get this together for some time, so it's 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 exciting to be here. It is. You know, I, I feel like I asked you to be on the show two and a half, three years ago. If you know, if it's not longer, better. I don't even know when we were together at and in, right. in Boxers Heaven or whatever right. it's called. Um, right. and you know, really got to know you there on, on mm -hmm. a deep level. And I'm not afraid to say that you beat me down physically and emotionally. Right. <laughs> um, but but that was anybody the purpose. that was the mission accomplished. And right. so the reality is like, I think anybody in self-development who's afraid to be beaten down, to be coached, to be questioned, to be pushed, mm, right. they shouldn't be in that space. And, and, and realistically, that's just life in general. Right. right? Sure. So why don't we start? I wasn't going to start here, but let's start there. So what, what is your thought process around individuals who duck and dodge, right? Mm -hmm. Stress, uh, adversity, all those other things. And, and what's the bonus of leaning into it? So that's a good question. That's a great question. So, you know, one of the things that uh, when people come to, we have, I coach two types of kids. I coach amateur level athletes and then within the amateurs, I have, you know, beginners all the way to elite level amateurs and then professionals. But a lot of kids explore fighting because they are scared, right? And they are and they have trouble regulating their emotions and they have trouble being accountable to things. And so they're thinking, well, if I can get involved in this sport and I can, you know, I, it'll give me some structure and then I can learn to regulate my emotions. And I see this with, with athletes. And back when I was in corporate America, I see this a lot, you know, it's, it's, um, regulating emotions and people learning to, uh, take accountability for their life that are really important things that, you know, that, that we like to teach as, as strong virtues within the sport. You know, uh, I tell people all the time when the kids, they, they come in or an athlete comes in, um, I said, I'm going to know within the first hour, whether you're my kind of guy or not. And, you know, if I tell you to run, if I tell you that you can't leave or you can't do something in, in, until 8.15 and you leave at 8.14, 49 and 59 say. I already know the kind of person you are. If I'm telling you to run, you know, uh, sprints and I see you miss the line a little bit, I already know the kind of person you are. And, you know, I have a thing with people who are, and, and listen, we've all done it. So let's also be, you know, we've all, there's no, there's no uh, perfection, but they, I, I have a thing with people who, uh, one of the virtues I think that sports teaches is accountability. And I have a thing with people who, don't hold themselves accountable. And I have a thing with people who can't regulate their emotions. And um, I think if you are going to be a successful athlete or a successful coach or a successful leader, um, holding yourself accountable to the things that, um, the little things, not the big things, we're all, we're, we can all be accountable to big things, but to the little things, you know, are you doing the work? Are you, are you doing it the right way? Uh, are you living? And then can you regulate your emotions inside that work? Um, those are the things that we kind of emphasize. And you had mentioned, you know, people who run around duck and avoid. The interesting thing about my sport, there's no ducking and avoiding. You mm. know, the, the once, you know, that we always say that the ring is the is the ultimate lie detector. You can bullshit me all you want. You can screw around and practice and do it. Once the bell sounds and you're in the ring, there. It's ultimate accountability. There's no dodging and ducking. There's none of that. So, you know, one of the things I like about the sport is that people reveal themselves, you know, and then, and, and, and the sport will reveal who you are if you've done the work and if you've held yourself accountable. So I have a, I have a difficulty. No, I don't. When I have a kid or an athlete who doesn't know how to hold themselves accountable, I recognize that, and that's a central piece of my focus as a coach. I don't have a problem coaching them, um, but I'm much harder on them, let's say, than I would be on other athletes, you know, it just by nature. For sure. And so it's interesting. I've never been in the boxing world. I've never done anything in boxing. I never sure. watched boxing other right. than maybe those Mayweather fight. fights, right? right. Like everybody, right. everybody tunes in. Right. Right. Um, and so when I was able to train with you and start to mm -hmm. learn 
um, the discipline it takes in order to make sure you're punch throwing punches the right way, make sure right. your feet are working the right way to make sure right. that your mind is working in the right, the way. right way. Like yeah. it was fascinating to me. Now I don't mm -hmm. want to get punched in the face. So I didn't sign up for another class right, with right. that being, with that being said, why boxing for you? And, and then I want to get into your backstory a little bit. Sure. So boxing was something that, uh, I love boxing because my father loved boxing and we identified in that together. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and so when I was young, you know, we used to sit around and watch this. There used to be this thing called wide world of sports. that used to come on and we would wait and hopefully boxing would come on. And my dad and I would sit in the kitchen and watch this black and white TV. Uh, and, and we, we commuted, you know, my dad and I connected in that way. So that was my, my love for the sport. And then when I went to the Silver Spring Boys Club where I grew up, they had a boxing program there, not an organized, not a well-run one, but a boxing program there. And I was introduced to it very young. But then uh, uh, I, got, I played football and, and baseball all through high school and then, and then baseball through college. And then um, I moved away from boxing, but came back to it later. But it was it was always something that was a I love of my life as a I, I love to do it and I'd love to uh, to watch it. And it made me feel closer to my dad. It was something that my dad and I shared. I always tell people, you know, my dad, you know, my brother told me, asked me, he said, you haven't been fishing in a long time. I said, I used to fish because dad liked to fish. You know, my dad, I don't fish anymore. I didn't like to fish. <laughs> You know, but the truth is I like the box. And I and and so, you know, my dad and I shared that in common. And I was a fan that the Boy Scout, I got introduced to it. And then I came back to it later. And uh, so that's how I that's, you know, it, my, the root of it is a love and a passion for the sport that I that I, I enjoy it as a as a fan. I enjoyed it as a communal uh, thing with my dad. And then I enjoyed participating in it when I was young, when I got older. Uh, I moved away from it, obviously, because I wanted to do important things and I wanted to, you know, make a lot of money. And I wanted to, you know, I just was, I was, you know, I went into a different thing, but I always did it in the past. They used to call me Bullworth uh, from the movie Bullworth because uh, I used to go to the gym at 5 a.m. and bang around with the guys in the gym. And then I'd go put my suit on, I'd go to work and then I'd get off work, go take my suit off, put my you know, my gym trunk back on and head back over to the gym and bang around with whoever's in the gym. And that was my life for a long time. So boxing is something that was exciting to me, something that I loved. I related to my dad about, and it also was something that I could constantly test myself, Justin, you know, constantly. Mm -hmm. I was very afraid a lot of times outmatched many times. Um, it was, fa I, I understood it, but it was something that personally challenged me. So I, I really, I have a love for it, uh, uh, the sport and what the sport means. And and so that's how I kind of got into it. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. They say often you, you talk about how, you know, you want to do big things. You wanted to go make a lot of money, you know, yeah. and pursue this, this corporate career. They always say when you're in your twenties, you chase money. When you're in your thirties, yeah. you try and solidify family. When you're in your forties, you start to live into your purpose or sometimes fifties, depending on right, where right, you're at. If you're right. lucky, you can do it in your forties. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how you went and chased the money and, and got the money and got the success. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that and where you were at and why you stepped back into boxing full-time as a coach. So it was interesting because uh, I was chasing money you know, and I equated success to money. So that's why I was chasing it. And uh, there's a lesson in that. And we can talk about that down the line. But um, but there was a time when Justin, you know, when you don't have a, when you don't like I went to college and I wasn't I didn't plan on being a doctor, or a lawyer or an engineer. So I went to school, and got a general, you know, a, a general studies degree. And I wasn't very focused. So when I got out of college, I had to get the gab and I could talk. So people say, you need to go into sales. I said, okay, I'll go into sales. Cause that, and they tell you, that's where all the money is. It's all right. I'm going to go into sales. I'm going to make a million dollars. And so I do, started doing different things and I wasn't failing, but I wasn't winning. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like many young people, I had, a, I had, a, I had a disease where I compared myself to other people a lot, you know, and I would look around and say, that guy's, he's half a numbskull. <laughs> and he's making a killing, you know, and I'm over here. I think I got my stuff together and, you know, I'm just, I'm doing okay, but I'm not, I'm not rocking it. I'm not killing it. And, uh, uh, 
so I was doing okay, but I had, I didn't have anything that was a passion. I didn't have anything I thought was special. Um, I was just selling, I sold, you know, services and computers and I, you know, I, and I was okay, but f- felt deeply unfulfilled. And, uh, and I don't, you know, I don't know about you, but when I get lost, me personally, when I get lost, I, uh, I pray a lot, you know? And so, and, uh, so I, 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 I wanted to be successful. And so I started praying and I, and I didn't really, I didn't come from, a, I, I came from a nice middle-class family. Um, and, but I started praying and I said, like, now what am I supposed to pray for exactly? Cause I don't even know what really, you know, so I started praying for just being successful. And I actually started praying for an image, which was an image I had of success. My mom took me to work one day with, a, you know, bring your kid to work day. She worked in this big office and there was this really successful guy in this building and she took me to his office and I, and the office left this indelible impression on me. So I started praying for that. And I prayed for that image. And, and what I'm about to tell you is true. And, uh, but then like most of the time you pray and then, then you pray and nothing happens. You know, you, you I didn't walk out and I didn't find a suitcase full of hundreds. And so I didn't, I didn't know what to do. So I just went back to work and kind of slid back into my life. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, like four or five months later, I was sitting around my house at night late. I got this phone call and it was a guy named uh, Chris Dona and Chris Dona had worked with me through another guy and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing sales. And he goes, well, why don't you come work with me? And I go, what do you do? He said, well, I'm, I'm the vice chairman of this senior level headhunting firm or retained search firm. And, Chicago and you know uh we're growing and we'd love to have a guy like you I go me you know like why do you want me I went through that whole thing you know Mm -hmm. and uh so I said why not so I put on my only suit and I flew to Chicago and I met the guy that did an interview I said you know you know what do I got to lose although I was wildly intimidated and uh I'm speeding through the story because it's a good story but uh so I took the job and uh all I knew is that everybody was in that building was making it, but they were rich. You know what I mean? To yeah. me, they had, they had, they didn't have watches on. They had, they had jewelry on that told time. You know what I'm saying? They had, <laughs> yeah. they were making it and they didn't have, they didn't have, they had real cars and they were doing it. And, uh, and I remember I went to my first, my first meeting with the, the company and I sat in this room, I got there early and I sat in this room and I watched all these people come in, Justin. And they were like hitters, you know, and they, they, you know, they had, they had, you know, $80 haircuts and, you know, they looked like a million bucks and, and I'm sitting there in an olive green suit, you know, like, you know, and I'm thinking, Oh my God. And, uh, I, I, you know, at the end of that day, I had decided I, my only goal was not to be the first guy to get fired. <laughs> and so I started doing this, this job and found out I was pretty good at it. And I, I was succeeding at it. In fact, I was really succeeding at it. And I was succeeding at it, Justin, just by hard work. Like I didn't have the relationships, the prerequisite relationship, the prerequisite experience. I was parlaying off the thing that Chris Dona had saw in me, which is my willingness to go out there and, and shake the bushes and, and go after it. And so I became a top producer, you know, and uh, this firm gave me a chance to be successful and I just want to digress a second. And about after a year and a half that I've been with the firm, we had changed offices. And I went, I was on a trip. And when I came back from the trip, I went to the new offices. And when I walked in, a uh, guy said, you know, your office is here. And I walked in and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm being heartfelt. I would tear up if, if I told the whole story. But when I walked in that office, it was like the office I had been praying for when I was successful. You know, my, my image of what was being successful with the same hue on the window, that green tint and the desk and the wood. And I remember I walked in, Justin, and I froze because it was so powerful to me. I got chills. I got chills right now because that happened to me. Mm. I prayed for that room because that was my only idea. What, you know, the thing I could, that was tangible to me about being successful. And when I walked into that room after a year and a half, you know, I got chills and I said, oh, my God, you know, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm actually doing it. And this is and that was the that was you. we all have these times. And, I, you know, I'm, you know, 
that was a moment when I really felt like, like God spoke to me, like, you know, literally spoke to me and said, you asked. And then you realize, you know, you know, you ask and you get it. And, and if I go in reverse, you know, I stopped praying, but I had to work so hard and so, you know, so much time. And it gave me a much more mature perspective on how, you know, how you achieve things and what, you know, how the universe works, I guess, you know, and, and, and all that. And, and, uh, so I was there for many, uh, for a number of years and, uh, achieved really nice success. And that firm, uh, gave me my first chance at being successful. It was called DHR International. And they were, they were good to me. Um, you know, I was a bull in the China shop there, you know, I mean, it was, you know, and so, uh, but they were good to me, but they gave me my first chance of being successful in business and life. And, uh, you know, um, but then, and then, uh, then, you know, uh, things happen and, and, um, uh, I, I lost my, I, you know, there's two types of guys and you're, 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 I think you're a lot like me in the sense that, you know, there are some people that can get up and they can go to work Monday through Friday and then they can chase their passion on the weekend. And that satisfies them, you know, and then there's cats like me. And I think you that we can't do that. You know, we, I, I gotta, like, I'm constantly being pulled towards the thing I like and I want, which would, which was, I also realized early on in my life that I wanted to be a coach because all the great men in my life when I was growing up were coaches and I wanted to be like them. So during this time of success, I was also headed into the gym and working. And as I got a little older, I organically became a coach of fighters. You know, I would be in there, I was a little older, they would come to me, I would talk to them. And Justin, that's all I wanted to do. Like work became, uh, you know, like a, like an obstacle to me. I said, how the hell can I get out of this joint so I can get to the gym, you know? And then days turned into half days and, and one thing led to another. I said, I'm out, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go, uh, just go coach for a living. And I was making a really nice living, really nice living in the, in the search business and moved in other things. But when I was decided to be a coach full time, that's not a brilliant economic, uh, <laughs> you know, strategic move. I, I, you know, I had, I, I had a fantasy. I was going to jump from one ledge to the other. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I jumped. And when I jumped, I went all the way back down to the bottom of the hill. You know, I mean, I really had to reinvent myself and spin it up out of thin air and I had to scrap and claw and, uh, uh, you know, finding money became, I had to find new avenues for money and, and, you know, within my own sport. And so, I had a learning experience. I had a, I had a great, um, I got bludgeoned over the head with humility. I got, uh, you know, I learned about myself and my own, you know, how to manage things. And so over a course of years, not, not months, not weeks, not years, I reinvented and, and rebuilt myself. And, um, I'm glad I did. I have, I have a ton of advice for people you know, uh, who want to jump. I encourage people to jump when you feel like you got to go. I encourage you to jump. You just have to, you have to spend more time knowing what you're jumping to and better planning than, than, than I did. So yeah. I got into it as a form of passion and I got into it, but I didn't, I wasn't the wisest cat when I made the move, you know, I made a, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, I made the jump twice. Cause, uh, the first time I, <laughs> I fell flat and had to go back into the corporate yeah, world. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, you know, year probably about a year after that jumped again and, and was able to kind of really build. But, you know, going back to your story of that visualization of, and that prayer, That's about, real, man. you know, this office that your mom had, I love that story. I have a similar one in a completely different vein, but it showed me the power of mindset, right? Like, so I'll, I'll tell the story briefly just to give context. I, when I was a kid, there was a show called full house, which we oh, used yeah. to watch as a family. And there was an episode it was one of the girl's birthdays. It was like her eighth birthday. And I remember this pop singer showed up. His name was Tommy Page. Came and sang happy birthday to Stephanie. But during the episode, he would hang out with Uncle Jesse like they were best friends. And I remember as a kid being like, man, I wish that was my life. Hanging out with all these cool people. All you know, That would be amazing one day for that to happen. Fast forward, I was about 23 years old. Um, in And, and I, that episode kept coming up. So that, that thought kept coming up. 
23 years old, 24 years old. And I was in a house in upstate New Jersey at a, a gathering of people. I remember I had a beer in my hand and I looked up and I went, holy crap, I'm in Tommy Page's house. Mm. And I became friends with Tommy Page. Wow. And there was no other idea of like, okay, this thing manifested itself because this was in the back of my mind. And mm -hmm. every step that I took led me to that, right? Hanging out with mm. people that were driven, that were motivated, that ended up in the music industry, that did all these things. And you have these little moments in life where you go, okay, what I focus on becomes real. Mm -hmm. So the point of me saying this whole entire story, how does somebody especially somebody who grows up in not a great area or somebody who's not, right. not going through a great time in their life. How does somebody avoid their thinking about the negative more often than the positive and how can they shift their mindset? So two things, you know, uh, one thing I've learned in life, whatever you, whatever you focus on expands. And so uh, I, I, I believe that, that totally through life experience, um, I, you know, I, my sport, uh, attracts a certain type of kid. And oftentimes those kids uh, don't play other organized sports. Oftentimes the kids uh, have, have pretty rough backgrounds, you know, and, you know, they're not, they wouldn't be, you know, I'm, I'm like uh, father Flanagan. You probably don't know who that is from boys town. You know, there are no bad boys. You know, I just, I got, but I get, I get a lot. I get a lot of tough kids and I have a lot of tough kids and a lot of tough circumstances. And, I think that the most, how does somebody, how does somebody, you know, I guess, find their way? I know that um, my, my, you have to find something. You have to find something and you have to find people, right? You have to find something and you have to find people that are going to help you on your way. I see that as my job, Justin. I see that as, as, as one of the roles. If I'm a, if a pro fighter hires me, he only gives a shit about winning and that's all they want me for. But when I'm working with kids, you know, uh, my job is to be that thing that to help these, these young people find that they, they've come to me for a reason. I want to, I want to ignite that passion in them. I want to uh, help grow and teach them and help them, find their own way to be successful. And I think, you know, uh, there are two schools of thought, right? And one of the schools of thought, Justin, is uh, find your passion and go after it, right? And another school of thought is find your talent and go after it and let your, and you can then chase your passion, you know, uh, later down the line. Um, I wish I could do the latter, but I, I, you know, my job in life is to help people, help young people find their passion. And so whatever that thing is, writing, you know, helping other people, um, normally what happens is when somebody finds their passion, they can't, they can't, they can't see all the way down the road with it they back away from it because if you ask people, most people say, oh, I could do anything I want as long as you tell me how to do it before I begin. And you know better than anybody. And, and you and I both know, none of us know shit from apple butter when we're starting. We don't know anything, you know, we're just, yeah. we're spinning it. We're spinning it up out of thin air. So oftentimes, you know, fear is the thing that keeps us from moving forward. And I, I say, go for your passion. Me, you ask me, Go for your passion or go for a talent, but find somebody in your life who's going to help you, who's going to you know, find a mentor, find a coach, find a team, find an organization, find a buddy, find a friend, find a girlfriend, whatever it happens to be that's going to walk with you because it gets lonely and it gets hard. And, you know, uh, if you find the right people and you find, or in my case, the right coaches, if you find the right people, you can go far. If, if you don't, if you constantly are on your own, it's very hard to go far and it's easy to be, it's easy to, to succumb to the, uh, the, the, uh, negative, the, the, the difficulties that you're going to face. And when you're accountable to somebody, plus, you know, somebody, somebody's there to help you, you can go much further. So the answer, the long answer to your question is, you know, find something that you want to do, but equally important is it's find 
people in your life that are going to help you do it. You know, find people. If, and if you, you know, if you're, if you, if you're a loner, that doesn't mean you can't find people in your life that are going to help you, you know? And, and I think that's a, I think that's a huge, m many people won't ask for help because it seems prideful. And, it, and I just think that's silly. Um, so my answer to your question is, you know, find your passion, but find people to help you who are going to be there for you to help you give you a hand when you're flat on your face, you know, when you ain't got the, when it, whatever that is and, and to help you along your way. And if you find that um, and you do it long enough, then you have another phenomena that occurs. And that phenomena that occurs is that people will start lining up to help you. Mm. Once you're in it, and once they see you're working, you become a sort of inspiration. And the people who were standing off to the side or the people who weren't interested in your journey all of a sudden will become interested in you, and what you represent. And if you're in it long enough and you found a little help and you're doing it long enough and you're kicking ass and you're all of a sudden forces just start to align for you and people start and then it becomes making about it comes about making good choices. You know, yeah, it's so choice. true. I mean, I, I wouldn't have anything that I have now without the people I've surrounded myself with. I mean, 100%. you're very close to somebody I'm very close right, with and right. Justin Cavanaugh. And um, he's a big piece to the puzzle accidentally. Like it was one right. of those things that just happened, right? He came around at the, the right time and uh, chose to be in my life because I was just open with him about what mm -hmm. I was going through. Right. And it's the perfect example of what you're talking mm -hmm. about is, you know, vulnerability and being honest with where you are and what you're going through shines a light on the people that are there to help you. And I think, again, like you said, the, the missing piece is being vulnerable or open or saying, hey, I need some yeah. help with this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to ask you this question. Obviously, boxing, there's a lot more boxers than there are professional boxers, right? right. Like it's right. it's like, you know, kids who play high school and college football, like a, a percentage right. of a percentage make it to the NFL. Right. How do you work with those kids who think they're going to make it, but yeah. you know, deep down, they don't have what it takes? Like, how do you work yeah. with them on the mental side? Because when it's over for them, it's over for them. Well, the, the, you're right. So there, there's a, there's a couple of dynamics. So I also coached high school football for years and team sports and individual sports are different. Um, and they have some differences, but you know, when you, when you are a, a, a young man, like if I go into my boxing gym, I have 160 kids in a program. Wow. Um, uh, and these kids, I have kids from every socioeconomic background, every race, creed, religion. You can, I got cops and robbers, sinners and saints. I got eggheads and I got, you know, dum-dums in there. And um, if I ask who wants to be a world champion, every hand goes up, right? And then you begin the task of, of, of teaching the sport. You help them, but you start teaching life as well. And one of the things I'm not a deal, I'm not a dream killer. Uh, but I do understand that we all have dreams and then some of our dreams die and we replace them with other dreams. And what my job, part of my job is, is to equip you to chase your dreams, uh, whether that be in boxing or something else. And those are the things that we teach, right? You know, the, the, I believe in teaching virtue through sport. I believe in virtue building, trying to build virtuous human beings. Because if you have somebody, you know, with, the, with, 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 with high character and strong accountability and you teach them uh, how to regulate emotions and to build some courage, and then you build and you teach them about disciplines and program building, all these things that are going on around them, uh, whether they're any good at, the sport or not, you know, and uh, if you're doing all that kind of stuff and it doesn't work out for them, which it doesn't work out for, for 99.99% of young men or women that come into the gym, they come in, you know, I, I want to do this. And some of them, you know, don't have the requisite talent. Some of them have the requisite talent, but don't have the drive or don't have the engine. Uh, some of them have the requisite talent, have the drive, have the engine, but make bad choices. There's all kinds of things that can happen. Um, but I feel like when I'm not coaching a professional who's just paying me to win, my job is to prepare them so that if their talents aren't enough, because boxing will 
ultimately come down to it's not like you know look uh you know i like to think that man you, you hire me and i got the secret sauce all the time when you come to the corner i'm going to whisper in your ear this special combination at this certain time but that's not how it really works it may work like that once every blue moon the truth it works is, like that is, in the movies it works like that in the <laughs> movies right right exactly you know but in real life it doesn't work quite work like that i mean there are elements of that and that's what you get paid for but uh the idea is to equip kids, you know, and when they, when, when, when they, the dream doesn't go for them, they don't win tournaments. They realize, you know, Oh shit, you know, I'm really not that good. And the sport is very difficult. The sport's very difficult. So a lot of people self-select it's like, you know, I, I tell people fighting is one of those things that sounds like a good idea until you get punched in the face. Yeah. And then it doesn't sound like such a good idea anymore, you know, and, and, you know, uh, so I feel like the way that you do that is by teaching virtue and then immersing kids in program building so that when they leave, whatever it is you've taught them, whatever program sport you're teaching, that they then can look around and apply all those things to their next thing in life. I, I, there's a, there's a, a great story about uh, John Wooden. I don't know if you know who John Wooden. John Wooden was mm -hmm. a basketball coach for UCLA, considered – by many is the greatest coach of all time in basketball. And every year he started out his basketball season the same way. He would get all the boys. These are the best boys in the country. Bring them to UCLA. They were all there to win national championships. He'd sit them down. And the very first day of practice is now, boys, this is how you put on your socks. And he would mm -hmm. teach them and tell them how to put on their socks. And he explained why. And all the boys remember that to a, to a to person when they talk about it. But what he was teaching you was the importance of fundamentals and the basic way to begin to be successful. And that's what you teach. And then you hope that they have the, the talent and all that kind of stuff. But most don't. You know, it's just a, it's a nature. So you teach the fundamentals of being successful. You teach what it's like to be immersed in a program so that when they go get a business, they want to say, I want to open a business. How do I start? they automatically know that things run better when they're in a design structured program. Those are the things you teach along with the sport by the way you teach the sport. And those are the lessons that make kids great. Those are the ones that stick with them and they can go on and have be good, you know, good, good family members and good brothers and sisters and, and eventually parents. Um, and, and then, the, so we don't, you know, it's, it's nice. It's nice when you have a kid who's at an elite, super elite level, talented level, but 99% uh, of the really good coach is done with the other kids. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's uh, the thing that you're trying, the things that you're trying to do is you're trying to use the sport to teach those things that will make them successful in life. And hopefully they're successful in fighting, you know, hopefully, um, but more importantly, you know, that's an old adage, right? They used to add, they asked, you know, how's they go up to, I, I can't, uh, Newt Rock, they say, how's the team coach? And he said, I'll tell you in 20 years, hmm, right? Yeah. You know, how are these kids? So I had, I, I, somebody asked me one time on another show, he said, you know, what would, what would success be for you, coach? And, uh, you know, I, I like fighting for, you know, titles and all that kind of stuff, pro boxing. And I like all that kind of stuff. But, but what would make me happy is that a kid driving in his car, you know, 20 years from now thinks of me and thinks, man, I hope coach should be proud of me. That's success, right? Cause I do that with my coaches. I just went to my college baseball coaches, uh, memorial service. He died at 93 years old. You know, I know that, the, that I'm his legacy and that's what I'd like to be. So, so, um, the way you teach, the way you, you, the way you, it, you're coaching success with athletes with the hope that they have the, the, the gifts and the tools and all the, the, the stuff that's required to be great. But, uh, it's unnecessary because the real goal of coaching in most cases is to teaching people how to be successful and how to have a mindset to be successful. And then that also requires, you know, I, in the first day of practice, the very first thing I say to the, an athlete that comes in and say, you and I are friends, buddy. You got to get that through your head. I don't care whether you like me or not. It's irrelevant to what I'm going to do for you. Mm. 
you could hate me. Okay. You'll love me in 20, but you could hate me, but I'm going to coach the shit out of you. Right. And you're going to be accountable. And I hold him accountable. And I said, listen, this is how it is. And, uh, and, you know, from that moment forward, you're teaching success. You're teaching success. They don't even have to have success in, in the actual sport. They're learning the process of success. And then you teach that. And eventually they take that process and they apply it, whatever their talents truly are, you know, and once they do that and they look back and say, man, you know, when you look at other people who are lost and they don't have the skills in their, their trick bag that you're giving them, you feel good about that. You so how much that. in the sport of boxing in particular, how much is it? You, Cause you were talking about the two nuances, right? Like how much is it the physical and the skill and how much is it the mental and the mindset? So that's a really good question because there's all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, what did Yogi Berra say? You know, baseball is 30% mental and 80%, you know, skill or whatever. Some, you know, yeah. for, did, uh, that's a really good question because we like to say, we like to say, you know, uh, hard work beats talent. We love saying that, right? We all do. You like to say it. I like to say it. All of us do, right? And there's an element of truth to that. There's an element. And then there's another saying that hard work beats talent when talent don't work hard. Hmm. Um, you, to be great in this sport, you need a lot of things. And, and some of the things you need, you need uh, a prerequisite set of skills uh, or, or prerequisite set of talents. And um, if you have some, some fundamental basic talents, and then you're willing to work extremely hard. Uh, sometimes those things marry. And then you have to have a whole set of circumstances go your way. You have to be in good relationships. You have to make good decisions. There's a whole set of things that are sort of that, that operate sort of outside your control a little bit that you have to have. But it's very rare, almost never that a guy makes it to the elite level in amateur boxing or to the, certainly the championship level in professional boxing without being born with a prerequisite set of talents, you know, and it's, it's I don't want to burst bubbles, but it's like that in everything, you know, one of your jobs in life is to find where you fit, where your talents are, you know, and, you know, if you don't have a certain talent for a thing that you love, and, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can persevere through it, but in this sport, you know, it, it, it's rough, Justin, you know, it's, this is a, a, you know, a very brutal business. Yeah. And especially when you, when you go one V one, it's a totally, totally. Thing. Yeah. It's a, it's a very brutal, unforgiving business. And, um, so if you don't got the prerequisite talents and you came to me, I have this all, this happens all the time. People don't have any self-awareness and they say, I want to be the, I'm going to be the champ coach. And I, you know, I see that they don't have the body to do it or the prerequisite talents to do it. Um, I coach the hell out of them, but I also uh, uh, move them uh, away from the sport when I can as quickly as I can, because this sport also has tremendous consequences. Tremendous. It's not rec league soccer. You know, if you fail in this sport, you're taking, it is a, you know, you, you're it tough. And if you're not going to be successful, you got to get the hell out, you know? And so yeah. I have a, I have an accountability and responsibility to the athlete to be, to work for their best interest. Sometimes their best interest isn't what they believe for themselves. I'm not a dream killer. And if I, you know, and I know after all these years, after 30 years, what, it, you know, if a kid has the goods or not, if he's got the stuff or not, or if we can compete somehow, if I can, you know, but there's a difference between that kid who's on the margin, who's got enough skill and enough talent, and he's able to work hard to compensate than somebody who just does not. And there's no amount of, uh, coaching and all that to, you can't make somebody who doesn't have it a champion and 
because the sport has consequences, you move them the hell out of there as quickly as possible. So you help them find another dream. You know what I mean? You help them find another dream. I, I certainly didn't have any of the, the, the uh, talents required to be a, a successful. Uh, I understood the sport and I was able to coach the sport and I was sharp and let things like, but I didn't have the talents. You know what I mean? So I, I found other ways, but then I came back to it in another, from another, another way. And I applied myself that way. That's where my talents are. So, you know, it's different for many things, but in boxing, if a kid doesn't have the, if doesn't have it, it's your responsibility to keep him safe. Yeah. I want to get your hot take on something that unfortunately got postponed a little bit, but what are your thoughts on the Mike Tyson, Jake Paul boxing match? So, uh, listen, there's a lot of haters for Jake Paul, right? And there's a lot of haters from inside boxing for Jake Paul. I'm not one of them. Uh, because Jake Paul has, has found a way I've been in this business, you know, a long time and there's making money in this sport is difficult. And there's a developmental side to this sport when you're developing a fighter. Well, when you're developing a fighter, it's basically it's money out, not money in. It costs yeah. money. You have invest in the fighter time, energy, plus real hard capital. Now I don't do it, but whoever's promoting him does it. I'm just a coach. Jake Paul has found a way to take the developmental side of boxing and make it profitable. He's out. He beat the system. Yeah. And he outsmarted it. And there's a lot of guys, you know, who are like me could be, you know, like, Oh, you know, that, that ain't real boxing. It's real boxing. It's developmental boxing. He's just doing it in a different way. And, uh, so I think like for me, if, if you're out there and, and you're making it happen, he's making it happen. You understand? He's making it happen. He's making a lot of money, making a lot of money, but he's making it happen. And he loves boxing and he's developing himself. He's developing himself while he's monetizing himself, which is an extraordinary. Usually there's only money at the top. You know, the super fights, the guy fought last week and the guy made 25 million other guy made whatever, 40 million. They make that, that money at the top. That money isn't, that money isn't down in the rank. Jake Paul is making that kind of money as a developmental fighter. If you're asking me to judge Jake Paul's ability as a fighter, he has a long way to go. He's completely untested, but most developmental fighters are incrementally tested. So it's not like he's doing anything that we wouldn't do. We pick the right fights. We, you know, we don't send our a developmental kid in with somebody who's a bone crusher. You know, we develop them. We, we put him in and, where, where he's where he has a, a really good opportunity of winning, but the other guy is going to fight and you develop. That's how you get good. That's what he's doing. He just is creative in who he selects. Plus, he brings a lot of eyeballs to the sport, which is great. I have a lot of kids that walked into my gym because they've heard of Jake Paul. I bet. And so I, I am completely, I'm not like a lot of my, you know, it's not traditional boxing. It's probably, uh, you know, and it's it's a little gimmicky. Right. But he's smart and he's monetizing a part of the sport that's very difficult to monetize. And now when it comes to fighting Tyson, you know, I'm 61. Tyson's 58. Uh, I'm a little worried about that because I can tell you for sure that, you know, after 50, you change. You you really become a different guy. And uh, whether or not that's a safe and smart thing to do for Tyson you know, I don't know. Uh, people think of people are looking at Tyson like that's oh yeah, Mike Tyson. He's just a man. He's okay. just a man, and now he's almost a sixty-year-old man, right? And it would not surprise me if it doesn't go well for him in the, in the fight. He may do great, you know. And they'll, they'll, when they show you all those training clips and shit like that, Justin, those are the highlights, brother. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying. They're not showing him getting out of bed the next day. They're not showing him, you know, getting his shit kicked in and sparring. They're not doing any of that. They're just showing him for 30 seconds, hitting the, hitting the minutes or hitting the bag. Oh, Tyson's back. You know, he got to yeah, I mean, and it's also, it's also 30 seconds and three at three seconds a clip. Yeah. 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 It's not real. I mean, all yeah. that stuff, when you watch like 24 seven, you watch all these fights, that's not real. That's hype, man. That's how they get you sucked in. Right. The real training is not particularly exciting and it's brutal. And oftentimes in real training, you're not doing that good, you know, and, and uh, 
but it's not, it, it, it's not, people wouldn't eat it up. So I liked it. I like what Jake Paul is doing. I, I, I admire him for outsmarting the system. It's good for the sport. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a, it's a wise thing, but I also know that uh, people handle Tyson and I'm sure that whatever the actual circumstances end up being, it's not going to be a quote, a quote fight, a regular fight. It's going to be some sort of structured event that's more akin to a exhibition than a real fight. Yeah. Uh, because the, just the, the athletic commission's liability, if Tyson yeah. gets hurt, with they're a going six to, year old man. Six year old man. They're going to sue the shit out of that uh, commission. And now, who in their right mind, using good judgment, would put a sixty year old man in with a twenty six year old kid? Now, who would do that? Nobody prudent, right? Wow. So wow. they're going to have to. The committee. There's going to have to be some something. You know, they'll they'll come up with some gimmick that makes it a makes it a exhibition. And they're going to make a lot of money in the process. Oh, yeah, I knew I would have been watching when it was in July, but now it's November and I'm still going to be watching in November. Yeah, so yeah, either sure. way, I'll be, I'll be tuning in and we'll see what yeah, happens. But, see what happens. but I wrap up every single interview with the same question, but before we get there, how do people follow you? How do they get a hold of you if they want to train with you? What's um, all that good stuff? So my, the gym is champion boxing fitness in Rockville, Maryland. I'm right outside Washington, DC. Uh, you can always look me up on Instagram at your corner, man. That's my thing. And, uh, uh, that's the best way to, to get a hold of me. Go through uh, to check my Instagram account out. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not, uh, I'm not like you and, and Cav where I can, I'm not great at social media. You know, you've got saying? great content. And actually we, yeah. we ended up talking about mindset so, so much. I didn't even bring it up, but one of my favorite posts here is you were talking to a fighter or we talk about visualization. I should say mm. you were talking to a fighter about, okay, now I want you to work through round one, round two, round three and right, shadow right. box it out. Like right. you, you're literally in these clips teaching visualization. What people need to do is remove the boxing part of it. Right. Right. Like, exactly. Yeah. You know, that, that's what universal skill, right. Universal skill. We just happen to use visualization. Like we have for the kids, you know, why do we teach visualization? You tell them because your brain doesn't make a distinction between a vivid image and an actual event. So it's your opportunity to visualize things the way in perfect. It's a, it's an opportunity for you to be perfect over and over and over and you know, and this is the last thing I'll say before you know before we move on. But uh, if there's any magic in the world, if there's any magic left in the world, it's the power of repetition. Because if you do something over and over and over, and your mind is engaged in that process, that there is a there is a moment which you cross over, where that turns from a from a desire to a belief, and once you move into belief. And once you're doing something and you believe it, it changes everything about you and the outcomes. And the only way that I know as a coach to attain that is through repetition over and over and over. But that's the grind because it's very, 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 it's, you know, it's hard. It's not pleasing. It's, it's, it's boring. It's mundane. But if you can grind in that, this desire to be successful, if you repeat yourself over and over and over in a perfect fashion, your psyche changes from something that you want to happen to something you believe is going to happen. And when you believe something's going to happen, you're a different kind of cat. You know, an instant when you jump into the ring and you look across and that guy believes he's going to win the fight. He don't want to win the fight. He's not there to challenge himself. He's not there to, he believes he's going to win the fight. And you look in his eyes and you see that you go, Holy shit. You know, we're, yeah. we're in, we're in for something tonight. You know what I mean? And of course the best fights are when they when both guys believe it, I love then you it. really, then you really got something. I love it. Like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. And that is in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Um, my biggest moment of growth. I would say, um, when I was working at that uh, headhunting firm early on, I was I, I I had a moment where I got a contract, and I remember I called into the corporate office to a woman named Gloria Segui. He was a wonderful gal, and uh, she was like she would, and I said, Gloria, I got a contract, and she said to me, Well, you're the first one. And I go, the first one, what? She goes, you're the first one in your class, my incoming class, to, to get a deal. And that moment changed my life 
because that moment I was so up to that. I had, I had a, a deep and profound feeling of inferiority sometimes, you know what I mean? I couldn't get it done or I wasn't going to get it done or I wasn't destined to get it done or it wasn't supposed to happen to me. And when I did it, I realized I can do this. What, and, and this just happened to be at that moment. And I've used that moment my entire life, Justin, you know, when I grew up against, I can do this because I have my doubts about myself all the time. You know, I mean, just, I'm just a man, regular guy. And, uh, you know, when I have my, when I love my private thoughts. So that moment, I was so out of water and so out of my league and so unprepared and so over, you know, overwhelmingly overmatched. And yet I had that moment of success. It changed me. It turned me into somebody who said, okay, I can do these type of, I can, I can be great. I can be great. If I focus, I work hard. I have the potential. Why not me? Why not mm -hmm. me? So that, that's probably my biggest moment of growth. I love it, man. Coach, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story sure. with our audience. This has been amazing. I appreciate mm -hmm. you and what you do, sure, not only for, you know, you know, these kids that you coach, but for the world mm -hmm. as you share your message mm -hmm. more and more. This has been great. Thank you, Justin. I was, it was an honor to be on and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon, brother.